Hi, today I'd like to talk about industrial gas turbine combustors. Specifically, in this video, I will focus on the combustion process inside single burner silo combustors, but this will be the first part of a series of videos discussing industrial gas turbine combustion technology, from silo combustors to annular and finally modern can annular designs. First, starting with a little history, the world's first gas turbine engine, which first operated in 1939, had a single burner silo combustor. This combustor was horizontally mounted above the compressor and turbine. In this engine, the turbine and compressor were mounted opposing each other so that the inlet and exhaust of the engine were in the center and the combustor was fed and exhausted at the sides. Silo combustors continue to be the dominant type of combustion used in industrial gas turbine engines until oxides of nitrogen or NOx emissions became an issue in the latter part of the 20th century. But even today, silo combustors are still used in some engines. Silo combustors offer a lot of advantages in terms of simplicity of design, easy maintenance. As they are bolted onto the pressure casing of the engine, they can be quickly removed and replaced if problems occur, minimizing engine downtime. They are also very robust and can burn a wide variety of fuels. They do have some disadvantages though, and this will be explained partly in this video and partly in future videos. In this video, I will focus on the earliest silo combustors which contained a single burner producing a diffusion flame. This means the fuel and air burn as they mix. These combustors are the most flexible in terms of fuels they can burn, even, even are capable of burning crude oil, which makes them very advantageous for driving oil pumps on pipelines, where they can obtain their fuel directly from the pipeline. To start with, let's discuss how the flame is stabilized. As I mentioned in earlier videos, the combustion process in a gas turbine combustor is a continuous process. Air and fuel are constantly fed into the combustion chamber and the flame burns continuously. Typically, the air exits the burner with an axial velocity of the order of 20 to 30 meters per second. If we consider natural gas as a fuel, natural gas is mainly composed of methane or CH4, let's look at a plot of the measured laminar burning velocity versus equivalence ratio. The vertical axis shows the laminar burning velocity, or SL, and the horizontal axis shows the equivalence ratio, or phi. The burning velocity is defined as the velocity of the fuel-air mixture upstream of the flame, where the flame remains stationary in space. If the velocity of the fuel-air mixture is higher than the burning velocity, then the flame will move downstream, and if it's lower, the flame will move upstream. Laminar burning velocity is the velocity when there is no turbulence in the fuel-air mixture. Equivalence ratio is defined as the mass fraction of fuel to air normalized by the mass fraction of fuel to air where there is exactly the right amount of fuel and air for complete oxidation of the fuel leaving no excess oxygen or fuel. To illustrate what this means, I've written three simple equations representing the reactions of different equivalents at, for different equivalence ratios. On the left side of the arrows, you can see the gases before the flame, and on the right side of the arrows, you can see the gases after the flame. If the equivalence ratio is 1, then the perfect ratio of fuel and air combined to produce only exhaust gases. However, if the equivalence ratio is less than 1, there's too much air, and so there is an excess of air remaining after the flame. And if the equivalence ratio is greater than one, then there is an excess amount of fuel, so there is unburnt fuel remaining after the flame. The peak laminar burning velocity for most fuels tends to occur close to an equivalence ratio of one, where the reaction rates and flame temperature also reach a peak. The laminar burning velocity for a premixed methane flame, shown in red, peaks at about 40 centimeters per second. Given that the speed of the air is typically in excess of 20 meters per second, which is 2,000 centimeters per second, you can see that if we had a laminar burning velocity, or a laminar flame with a burning velocity of 40 centimeters per second inside the combustor, it would blow out. 
Now, one way to increase the velocity of the flame is to add turbulence to the flow. Turbulence causes the flame front to distort and wrinkle. And here I show a typical snapshot for an instant in time of a turbulent flame. Of course, turbulence is a transient phenomena, and so the shape of the flame will change with, with a, as a function of time. The result of this, though, is that the area of the flame, of the surface area of the flame, increases. Given that the consumption rate of the unburnt fuel and air approaching the flame is proportional to the flame's surface area, this means that the flame can consume a greater volume of fuel and air, and thus the burning velocity increases. The greater the amount of turbulence, the greater the wrinkling and distortion of the flame, and thus the greater the flame surface area, and the higher the burning velocity. This works to a point, but as the turbulence increases, both heat and radical species within the flame front are diffused. Heat is easy to understand. Radical species are intermediate species which are formed during the combustion process. But both of these are necessary to sustain the reaction. And so above a certain level of turbulence, portions of the flame will start to extinguish. And this causes a reduction in the, the rate of increase of the turbulent burning velocity and will eventually cause this velocity to start to decrease with increasing turbulence. And above a certain turbulence intensity, um, the flame will eventually fully extinguish. Looking at a plot of measured turbulent velocities for methane versus turbulence intensity, focusing on the curve for an equivalence ratio of one shown in red, one can see that for methane, the maximum turbulent burning velocity is roughly 400 centimeters per second which is still an order of magnitude below the typical airspeed. So again, if we relied only on tur the, a turbulent flame, the flame would still blow off. Now, turbulence is still important as it increases the overall rate of reaction. So gas turbine combustors are designed to generate a lot of turbulence. However, this is not enough to stabilize the flame on its own. Okay, so far we've been discussing premixed flames, in other words, where the fuel and air are mixed before the flame. Modern industrial gas turbine combustors employ this approach, but earlier combustors like the single burner silo combustor did not premix the fuel and air prior to combustion. Combustion occurred in the mixing layer between the fuel and air. As was stated earlier, this sort of flame is known as a diffusion flame. Because the fuel and air are not premixed, the mixing rate between the fuel and air, which is much slower than the chemical reaction rates, limits the overall reaction rate. Thus, turbulence plays a very important role as turbulence enhances this mixing rate. But again, even if we had infinitely fast mixing, which would approach a premixed flame, as we have seen, turbulence alone will not stabilize the flame. Now, if we look at a typical single burner combustor, you see that the fuel is injected in the center and the air enters through a swirler surrounding the fuel lance. Downstream of the burner in the combustion chamber, the flow experiences a sudden expansion. This produces an annular recirculation zone between the outside radius of the burner and the wall of the combustion chamber. If the air entered without any swirl, of course, it would eventually expand to fill the whole of the combustion chamber downstream of this recirculation zone. However, because the air is entering swirling, this expansion will actually occur faster. You can understand this if you imagine holding a string with a massive object like a stone attached to the end and then spinning that up. You'll feel a force on the string pulling radially outwards. The mass at the end of the string wants to travel in a straight line, and in order to keep it traveling in a circular motion, you need to apply a constant force to accelerate it to keep changing its direction so that it follows a circular path. The faster you spin, the weight, the stronger the force is required. And swirling air works in the same way. The flow wants to expand until it's confined by the outer shell or outer wall of the combustor. The greater the degree of swirl, the stronger the force driving its expansion, and the faster the swirling air will expand to fill the combustor. All of the mass contained within the, the column of swirling air feels this force to expand, 
And so the mass at the center of the vortex will drop as it moves radially outwards. This results in a reduction in the, in the static pressure at the core of the vortex. If the degree of swirl, or in other words, the, sp the speed at which the air is spinning is fast enough and the expansion of the flow large enough, then the vortex will break down within its core. In other words, the pressure at the core will drop so much that the flow will be pulled inwards towards the low pressure region at the center of the vortex. And this produces an annular recirculation zone at the center of the vortex. So inside the combustor, there are two recirculation zones, one in the corner between the outer radius of the burners and the wall of the combustor due to the sudden expansion, and one at the axis of the combustor due to the breakdown of the vortex produced by the swirling airflow. Fuel is injected into the central recirculation zone of the vortex. Thus, this central region has 100% fuel and cannot burn. Outside of this region, there is only air, which also cannot burn. Between these two regions, the fuel and air mix, and it is here where the flame can stabilize. Downstream of the flame, the hot exhaust gases are entrained into the central recirculation zone within the vortex core and recirculated back upstream where they heat up and ignite the fresh fuel air mixture at the leading edge of the vortex. And this is how the flame is stabilized in a single burner gas turbine combustor. Now, if we look at a profile across the mixing layer between the air and fuel, I've plotted the flame temperature versus equivalence ratio. On the left side of this plot, we're approaching 100% air, while on the far right side of this plot, we're approaching 100% fuel. I've focused the plot on the region where the combustion is possible, in other words, between the lean and rich blow-off limits. Flame temperature rises, peaking near an equivalence ratio of 1, beyond which it drops again. CO emissions rise as we approach the lean blow-off limit. CO, or carbon monoxide, is toxic to humans and other animals as the hemoglobin in our blood it preferentially binds with CO over oxygen. But additionally, the oxidation of CO also releases more heat and so any CO present in the exhaust gases is lost heat energy for the engine. Thus, CO is an indicator of the combustion efficiency of the engine. CO is the first species produced in the flame when oxidizing the carbon atoms of the fuel. And this is then further oxidized to CO2. This latter step is slower than the production of CO, and like most reactions, is an exponential function of temperature. So as the temperature drops, the rates of this reaction also drop exponentially. If additional heat is lost due to mixing with colder air, then these reactions can be quenched and stopped altogether. Approaching an equivalence ratio of 1, where the flame temperature is the highest, the rate of nitrogen oxidation reaches its peak and NOx production is at its maximum. In the latter decades of the 20th century, NOx was realized to be a pollutant as it was discovered that it helps to produce ozone. While ozone is important at high altitude, where it blocks a fraction of the ultraviolet radiation from the sun, ozone produced at the ground can cause breathing difficulties in humans and other animals and cause harm to certain vegetation. Just a side note, NOx can also react with ozone to destroy it, so it's also important for high-flying aircraft to limit their NOx production to avoid damaging the high-altitude ozone layer. Air is composed of 78% nitrogen by volume. The oxidation of nitrogen, as with most reactions, is exponential with temperature, which is why the peak production of NOx occurs when the flame temperature is at its highest. Nitrogen can also be found as a component in some fuels, and this fuel-bound nitrogen will oxidize at an even higher rate than nitrogen gas in the air. There are ways to deal with this, which I will not get into in this video. However, it is sufficient to say that close to an equivalence ratio of 1, the maximum amount of NOx will be produced. As we approach the rich blow-off limit, smoke will form. Smoke is solid particulate consisting mostly of carbon, which condenses out of the flame. 
Smoke is a problem as it can harm the lungs of humans and other animals and is believed to cause cancer. Smoke forms when there is insufficient oxygen to oxidize all of the carbon in the fuel. As the reaction rate is the highest close to an equivalence ratio of one, the majority of the fuel will be oxidized close to this value in the flame. Thus, this sort of combustion tends to produce a lot of NOx. However, as the rate of reaction is limited by the mixing rate between the fuel and air, this sort of combustion also tends to oxidize less CO and produce more smoke, leading to higher CO and smoke emissions. One way to reduce NOx formation is to inject water into the combustor. Water will absorb heat as it evaporates and forms steam. This will reduce the flame temperature, reducing the production rate of NOx. The steam will also increase the volume flow through the turbine, generating more power, which will offset to some extent the power required to pump water into the combustor. It should be noted that reducing the flame temperature will also reduce the rate of oxidation reactions of CO and smoke. Thus, things which help reduce NOx tend to increase CO and smoke, and vice versa. This is one of the primary reasons modern industrial gas turbine engines moved away from diffusion flames towards premixed flames, which will be discussed in a future video. The combustion process of a silo combustor is limited to the primary zone or the region of the combustor immediately downstream of the burner. Downstream of this zone, a large fraction of air from the compressor is injected bypassing the primary zone. This region is known as the secondary zone. This air mixes with the exhaust gases from the primary zone, reducing the temperature to a level which the turbine can tolerate. As this air reduces the temperature of the flow, the reactions are quenched and the reaction rates are drastically reduced or stopped. Thus, it is important to size the primary zone so that it is large enough to ensure complete combustion of the fuel and oxidation of any CO and smoke which formed. At the same time, the primary zone should be as small as possible as NOx formation is also linear with time. Thus, there is a balancing act when laying out such a combustor to ensure optimal combustion efficiency and minimum emissions. So in conclusion, the single burner combustor offers a very robust solution, which is extremely fuel flexible. However, it is very challenging to optimize regarding NOx, CO, and smoke emissions. Prior to NOx being considered a problem, this was less of an issue, as things which reduce CO emissions also reduce smoke emissions. And so the optimization of such a combustor was straightforward. However, given that most things which help to reduce NOx emissions tend to make CO and smoke emissions worse and vice versa, concern over NOx was the main driver to move away from diffusion flames towards premixed combustion. Okay, so this concludes this video. In the next video, I want to focus on the airflow and cooling aspects of silo combustors. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please click the like button below. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks.